So we're going to look this morning. We're going to look at who John is. We're going to look at who Jesus said they were and who Jesus said he was. So three different things. But John was interesting. And often we think about how he, he ate the locusts and honey. Nick Ripkin is one of my favorite guys to, to listen to and read. He's a, that's not his real name. He's a minister, uh, missionary uh, in Africa a lot and, and other parts of the world, uh, like Soviet Union when it was still the Soviet Union. But anyway, he was talking about moving into an African village and being the, the only whites that were in that village, a village not accustomed to them. And so the, the, the first week that they were there, his wife sent him to go get some sugar at the store, nearby store, because she wanted to cook something that night. So he walks into this store and he asks for sugar. The lady screams, backs away. And he said in 15 minutes, he went through three different ladies. All of them screamed and backed away when he asked for sugar. He said, finally, a man came down some stairs from an upper room and, and with this perfect British type English asked him what he wanted. He said, sir, what do you want? And he said, I'm, I just want some sugar. My wife's going to be cooking tonight. That's what I told him. My wife is making dinner tonight. I need some sugar for the dinner. She sent me here to get it. He said, well, sir, in our language, there's only one letter difference between sugar and dead body. We don't know what you eat. You're new here. And you come in here asking, using the wrong word, and not asking for sugar like you think, but you are asking these ladies for a dead body because your wife wants to cook tonight. <laughs> so they, you kind of look like John the Baptist to them. The oddity of John and what he ate, how he dressed, and where he chose to do his ministry compared to where Jesus did his. And Jesus makes that comparison. As he talks, uh, starting in verse 16, he says, what shall I compare this generation? And the, the way he can compare is just by looking at how they treat John and how they treat him, Jesus himself. He said, it's like children sitting in a marketplace who call out to the other children and say, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating or drinking and they say, he's got a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking and they say, behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. Say what you want. What are you doing? How are you living your life? It's vindicated by what they are doing. And he's just pointed out what his ministry is doing and who John is. That's the vindication. Even though all these things are being said to try to actually demonize John, and also they called Jesus because of the miracles he did. They called him, it's satanic, that that was the power that was behind it. The Bible tells us to be childlike, but it doesn't tell us to be childish. And this generation that Jesus points to because of how they saw John and Jesus was being childish. They were likening John's ministry to a funeral. We played a dirge. And you didn't mourn. And they were likening Jesus' ministry to the party life. That he was running around with all the, the sinners in town. And John called people to repentance. Jesus called people to the repentance. They had the same message. That people were to cry out for repentance. That they were far from God. And you have these two different extreme ways. And they found a way to criticize both. Of these ways so Jesus tells them in verse 20 who they are he said he began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles were being done because they did not repent he had been going from city to city to city and if you have been here with us you have seen an amazing sermon but you've also seen miracles parables wonderful teachings that Jesus has given all throughout the ministry that he has done here. And yet they weren't repenting. I heard about an atheist group that put up billboards around different American cities. And the billboards, and Fox had this uh, on, on their news. The billboards said this, go ahead and skip church. 
and it had on the billboard a smiling Santa Claus with a text saying, just be good for goodness sake. Happy holidays. Now that's the message of the world, number one. Number two, they don't need a billboard to tell most people not to go to church. I mean, we are looking at, in, in our country, where hopefully we get 20% of a membership in a church. Atheists are going to do damage, maybe, and just remind people to go. Why does this, a nation, a city, not respond toward God, but go in the opposite direction? Here they were presented with all of this amazing ministry. And Jesus is going to make the point that because of what you've been exposed to, that actually sets you up for greater judgment. Your lack of reaction to a greater evidence of who God is and what God has done and what God is doing sets you up for greater judgment. And these cities were actually in Galilee where Jesus had been doing all these different miracles and had his, his ministry. And many people live in countries like the United States of America that have a heritage with a lot of Christianity in it. A lot of churches that are all throughout their cities and countrysides, and yet they don't repent. That's going to weigh against them when it comes to judgment. Many people have grown up in a family that loves God, that has been faithful. Mom and dad have been faithful. And yet they have chosen not the same, same direction in their life. And yet they have been exposed to that. You know, I often think, you know, why don't people listen? Why do I have a, a problem when I try to communicate the gospel to people that they can just glaze over, they can yawn, they can walk away totally indifferent to things that have dramatically changed my life? How can they reject that kind of witness? But then I need to remember that there are those people who have rejected the most amazing witness possible. They rejected Jesus. Jesus came to people and he, they walked away. So I shouldn't be surprised that I can think I've got the best argument, the best uh, evidence of a miracle, miraculous in my own life or something, and they'll just walk away. Satan is blinded, blinded the eyes, blinded the hearts of the unbelieving. And here Jesus says, woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Nevertheless, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. Now here Jesus is, is picking out these three Gentile cities, Tyre, Sidon, and he's going to talk about Sodom, and comparing them to where he's been doing this, the most ministry, which is Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum, which is kind of a, a, a three-area city. It's called a, a triad because it was such a strong Jewish area. They even had, had uh, uh, synagogues that were built with steps in them that, that were representative of the temple steps and the synagogues were put in the prime locations in the city so they, they had all this heritage and of course with the Jews you've got the word of God, you've got a tradition you've got the feast, you've got all this that should have made them respond and yet they didn't then you've got Tyre, Sidon, Sodom these were uh, Tyre and Sidon were port cities, and port cities were, were notorious for wickedness, where the sailors would continually come in, and, in, in from the sea, and they would have all the system of uh, entertaining them. Terrible places. And yet those places also didn't have the witness that these other places with all this heritage had. You know, in our day, we might think of some place like San Francisco or New Orleans, uh, Las Vegas, Hollywood. Tyre was, was so evil, prideful and evil, that Ezekiel actually compared their king to Satan. That's how evil they were. 
and these cities had all of this going on inside of them and you know their behavior was so so profound that all of them got destroyed at, at some point but jesus is saying there's actually better off for unbelieving pagans than for or believing unbelieving pagans than for unbelieving jews these cities were judged in time those who reject like these cities of galilee were doing were going to be judged in eternity it's much worse san francisco bay area which we're very familiar with takes the top spot when it comes to de-churched adults de-churched adults what once was the population church-wise to what's been de-churched people that have walked away from the church following that seattle portland boston what do they have in common now riots burning unchurched <coughs> cities the top ones this is barna san francisco seattle portland new york boston los angeles and if you go all the way to 50 you finally hit a texas city austin who would have thought Austin would be on a list like like this but here you have rebuke by Jesus linked to privilege linked to privilege many miracles that happened and you would think that those many miracles would result in revival in re repentance the miracles don't always result in changed changed hearts one of the things I've learned in ministry that it's amazing what unbelief can fend off <laughs> the, the miraculous that God can do even in a person's own life and they can still refuse refuse to repent and bow down and recognize Jesus for who he is and these cities were not like Jesus's own city that tried to throw him off a hill they didn't do that they didn't stone him and they didn't try to run him out of town they just ignored him they just ignored him. They acted as if what he did didn't matter, no matter how amazing it was. Uh, verse 23, it says, And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You will descend to Hades, for if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, which occurred in you, it would have remained to this day. Nevertheless, I say to you that it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you remember what happened to the land of sodom fire and brimstone it would be more tolerable for what happened to that city land wise than what's going to happen to you in judgment spiritual wise you know jesus jesus never went to sodom he never went there and cast out demons there was a lot there i'm sure healed people he, he never went and did that but he did do that in Capernaum quite a bit. You know, there are places around the world that have, have not had near the exposure to God's truth, to Bibles available everywhere you can imagine, every store, you know, go to Target, go to Walmart, <coughs> go to a bookstore, go online. You can find the Word of God everywhere. Different versions, different colors, different notes in it. It's available everywhere. Are we going to be judged more for that? I mean, we look at them as resources, as tools that we can we can really do things for the gospel, but are we? Are we going to be held accountable? Here's Capernaum, which was actually the home base for Jesus. This is his, became his, what would be his hometown. And he's denouncing them. And when you read this, you realize that he's revealing here that there are actually degrees of judgment. Degrees of judgment. Yes, yeah, Sodom's going to be, be judged, but even greater is going to be Capernaum because it's a higher degree of rejection of the gospel. So it's not necessarily how many sins you have done in your life, it's how much of truth you've rejected. How much have you rejected the truth? 
And often your life has allowed more truth to filter your way. And yet you chose to, to reject it. You know, there are, uh, we look at rewards, so there are differences in rewards for people in eternity. And here you have Jesus indicating there's going to be differences of judgment as well. Paul said in Romans chapter 2, verse 5, but in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. And again, here you have these people who have had privilege. They have lived in the day and time where Jesus and John the Baptist have actually lived and done ministry. So I, I have been blessed to live in a time of Billy Graham, of Robbie Zacharias. I can't make a long list. Adrian Rogers. It's really hard to make a list now. But I got to be exposed to that. There's accountability there. How did I react to when the filter was, was not so clogged? When I heard all this truth and heard it in environments uh, of churches that you know, you know, really preached the gospel at one time in this country. How did I respond to that? Well, finally, Jesus said, this is who I am. You know, why were they not able to understand who Jesus was with all of these things going on. You know, what is this inside of a person that, that makes them able to reject the gospel? Well, they reject two things. Number one, they reject the message itself. And in verse 25 and 26, Jesus says, you know, after talking about the difference between him and John and how they were children in this generation, then he directly condemns them for who they are and how they're reacting then he stops, and in the midst of, if he'd have just stopped right there, it'd be like, oh, where's the hope? But then he turns everything to the hope. And he starts off by giving thanks for those who are responding to the message, even while those aren't responding that he's just spoken of. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this way was well-pleasing in your sight. Paul said, the fool is set in his heart. There is, or John, David said, the fool is set in his heart. There is no God. Paul said, professing to be wise, they became fools. Paul also wrote, when he talked about those in the Corinthian church, there are not many of you wise in this world we talk about it's hard for a rich man to get to heaven because he depends on that wealth and security it carries over to people who who think they're smarter than the simplicity of the gospel they're going to figure out their own way and we've all run into somebody who's just too smart. They demean you. They look down on you. Boy, you are stupid to believe that. Professing to be wise. And the context of that is they rejecting God by all the evidence that God had given them in all of creation and the very, the very inside of us with eternity in our hearts, as it says in Ecclesiastes, that we have been geared to religion, to seek after God, as Acts 17 says, that we might grope for him and find him. And yet they're smarter than that. They're smarter than that. We're watching this dumb show called 90 Day Fiance. None of y'all watch it. It's just us. We're bad Christians, I know. There's a guy in there. He's going to... Ukraine and the girl there loves God. No, oh, I don't believe in God. It's all aliens. It's all aliens. There were aliens and people thought they were gods. Who made the aliens? Where did they come from? But he's smug. 
He says it, well, I'm so smart. You're not. Surrounded by it. You know, they have, they've gone from, it all came out of a pond and you know, the, to alien ships came by and emptied their sewage tanks. And out of that, life came. I mean, they've had to keep adapting and adapting because it didn't work, didn't work, didn't work. And Jesus comes along and says that because of they think they're wise and intelligent, sarcastically saying that, it's been hidden. It's been hidden. And that was well-pleasing to God who hates pride. That in our pride, we would find him. We become his children if we're going to find him. That's why he says here, you've revealed it to, to infants, to those who are willing to humble themselves. And they reject not just the message, they reject the man. Verse 27, he says, all things have been handed over to me by my father. No one knows the father except no one, no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son will reveal him. He was the very, he was the, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. He was the very avenue that Scripture had been pointing to, pointing to, and pointing to. All the road signs of, of the Old Testament point to Jesus, point to this time in history. They not only rejected the message because they were too smart for it, they rejected the man himself. You think about when you're witnessing that miracles, as I've hinted to, miracles aren't as powerful as we think they should be. You know, Jesus told a parable about the rich man and Lazarus, and the rich man in, in torment said, can you please send somebody back from the dead to show my five brothers and the response was, if they don't believe the law and the prophet, Moses and the prophets, then they're not going to believe even if someone rises from the dead. And they didn't. They rejected Jesus in his testimony, even after his resurrection. We think miracles are going to do the deal, but Satan can mimic miracles. He can mimic it. And in the last days, there are going to be signs and wonders that lead people astray. And we're warned in the, in the Old Testament law that when somebody does that and then they lead you in a different direction of God's revealed truth, that you are to reject them as false prophets, even though the miracles happen. We live in a supernatural as well as a natural world. And the supernatural is not limited to God and good angels. There's the demonic out there as well. And not only miracles, but crowds don't mean you're getting it right as well. You had many people who were following Jesus out of excitement and the miracles that he was doing and what they were, were hearing. But here he's saying, you're no closer to God. You're no closer to God. They're going to be of that group that he's going to have to say, I never knew you. Even though you... you thought you were following, but you're following under your terms and not my terms of repentance. Now you have verses 11, 28 through 30. If there's any verses you probably know, these are the verses. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. I am gentle and humble of heart. You'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. My burden is light. After he's told them who they are, how they've rejected John, how they've rejected him, and how bad that is, what that means, he, that they have, in their so-called so intelligence, that they have not repented. And he turns around and he gives this amazing invitation. It's not too late. Now you know what the problems are. Now you know the invitation has to be a simple coming to me. He didn't say come to religion. Go to the temple. Go to church. He said come to me. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. 
Bring your burdens to him. There, there are people trying to figure out what to do with their burdens. Everywhere. They take their burdens to the bar. They take their burdens to alcoholism. They take their, their burdens to uh, some addiction after another. It helps them escape for a while, but it doesn't get rid of the burden. It just puts a little more weight with it. Jesus said, bring your burden. Those burdens that come with being human are, are meant to entice us to move toward a solution that really works, which is Jesus Christ. He says, come to me. Those who are weary and heavy laden. I don't know about you, but this human stuff just wears me out sometimes. Sometimes it's like, okay, it's Monday. Oh, now it's Monday again. Every day after, one after another, Monday, 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 Monday. Where did the rest of the week go? I mean, where's the other days? They're not here anymore. Because you're weary and you're, you're heavy laden. And supposedly this happens most often to those who are in their 40s, but they don't get it all. All of us get it. Where do your body starts doing weird stuff? When you get a little older in the 40s. Someone said that life is like wrestling a gorilla. You don't rest when you get tired, uh, but you rest when the gorilla gets tired, but he never gets tired. He's always got a, another hold to put on you. He's constantly wrestling, and that's what life is like. It just never gets tired. And people who are here are weary and heavy laden, they are ready to, to rest. Now notice the rest that he offers is not that I just got to get a good night's sleep tonight. That'll help. That'll fix everything. That's not the rest you need. Rest for your souls. You can get amazing sleep and your soul is still worn, heavy laden, weary. It's just weighted down. It's never going away. How do I fix what's going on inside of me? Jesus said, come to me, and that he will give us rest. We can't go, go buy it somewhere. He's got to give it to us. Now, that sounds good, but then his way of giving us rest. Now, the way I'm going to give you rest is I'm going to put a yoke on you. And if you're not from Oklahoma, you don't know what a yoke is, right? I know what a yoke is. It's, it, you got to put two oxen together, link them up so you can use both of their power in unison. He says, take my yoke up, up, up on you. We don't, we want to take a lot of things from Jesus, but taking his yoke, I want to take, you know, you to get rid of my burdens, but make life easy and all these other messages people are hearing today. Is, we're not asking, oh, give me your, the hardest life you can give to me. We don't ask for that stuff. To take, uh, take his yoke. Uh, again, it, it was put on an animal so that that animal could pull, link to another one. And taking that type of thing upon ourselves, Jesus says the end of that will be that you will learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls when we're in unison with him. Rest. You know, rest has been skewed. Rest is a word all the way back to the first chapter of the Bible. Where it says God rested after the six days of creation. Now, do you think God was saying, man, I'm tired. That wore me out. That's not what rest is all about. And, and you go into, even today in Israel, on the Sabbath, there are certain neighborhoods. If you drive through those neighborhoods, you're not supposed to be moving around. They'll throw rocks at your car for being out and about on the Sabbath. You're only supposed to travel so far. And because you can't cook on a Sabbath, they'll check into hotels. And in those hotels, you know, the restaurant will cook for them, so they're not working. They're making other people work. But there are actually elevators called Sabbath elevators. You might have three or four elevators there. One of them will be designated a Sabbath elevator. And you'll go in and you'll think, wow, there's lines before these other ones. That elevator, nobody there. So you go and you get in that elevator. It's a Sabbath elevator. That means 
their belief that pushing the button is work means that that elevator is going to stop on every floor automatically so nobody has to push a button. They have skewed the idea of what rest is. Rest is rest for our souls. And to think that yoking ourselves with Jesus Christ and learning from him, that that is actually the pathway to finding rest for our souls. It's to actually get busy for God in his power and strength. That's where that rest is found. And that rest is sustained by constant confession of sin, obedience through our God, uh, obedient faith in our lives, trusting, obeying. The trust and obey is no other way. When you, this word, you know, talks about uh, he is gentle. That word was, <coughs> was used about being tame. If you have a horse that's getting ready to, you're going on a journey with a horse, and you've looked at the map, do you get off the horse and show the horse the map and say, this is all, where, this is all our turns, this is where we're going? That horse doesn't need to know that. It just needs to be tame, trusting, obeying, following the lead of the one that it is, in a sense, yoked to. That's what happens when we yoke ourselves to Jesus Christ. We become humble. We give ourselves over to his leading in our life, and we allow him to teach us how to follow him. And as we do that, we learn from him. We become his disciple. But we have to follow what he says initially, and that is to come to him and to take this yoke upon him. And remember, Jesus is a carpenter. He's made some yokes. He's made some yokes. He knows how to make them comfortable. And whenever a, a yoke was made for an ox, that ox would be brought in and measured and everything would be prepared and then uh, be prepared while the ox was taken away. Then the ox would be brought back and it would be put on this ox. And if it was a young ox <coughs> and it was going to be yoked to a more seasoned, older ox, it would be yoked in such a way that the burden would fall more on the older, seasoned ox while the younger ox was learning. We're going to be yoked to Jesus. We're going to be walking lockstep with him. But it will be his power, his abilities that will be carrying the load. Even though we're yoked with him and we're learning. And this yoke is so fashioned that it's comfortable while we wear it. We thought, well, it's going to be hard. There's nothing harder than missing out on why you're here on this earth. And trying to figure it out yourself and accomplish things in your own strength. It's amazingly more easy to see the power of God start to work in your life. And his yoke is, is uh, he says, my burden is light. You know, the, the idea is it's easy. I don't know, these people wearing wooden shoes all these years over in Holland, Netherlands now. I can't imagine a wooden shoe being comfortable, light, but if it's perfectly fashioned, I guess maybe it is. We can't imagine a yoke that is perfectly fashioned. It's going to feel better in those padded pews and padded chairs you're sitting in. The Pharisees like to put burdens on people, not lift a finger to help them after they put the burdens on them. And Jesus comes along and tells them, I've got a tailor-made yoke just for you. And it's going to be light. It's not going to be like the Pharisees that you've been used to putting these heavy burdens on you. I mean, you're coming to me because you are weary and heavy laden. I'm not going to add to that. I'm going to take that burden off because I'm going to share. In a sense, share. You're going to be representing me but I'm going to be carrying the load. I'm going to be the power behind your life. 
The Bible says that all of us like sheep have gone astray. We've turned aside each to our own way. Um, and when we do that, we lead a, a life outside the yoke that usually ends up with burdens, mi misery, and pain. Nowhere to take those burdens that works. Jesus said, bring them to me. Those, I've allowed those in your life so that in them you would seek relief and learn to seek it in the right, right direction. We were never made to run our lives. Look around the world. You can see how people mess up their life trying to run it themselves everywhere. We were made to be linked to God. That's how he created us to be. We are not who we need to be apart from God. We can, it doesn't mean we go out and be something for God. We are to link ourselves to God and he makes something through us. That's what Christianity is. Jesus himself humbled himself to God and yoked himself with God's purpose and came to earth, emptying himself of, of all his divinity, divinity could have offered him so that he could make himself associated with us so that he could go to the cross for us for that purpose we're to do the same thing we're to humble ourselves and link ourselves